Thank you for being in time. I'm here to present panel one and to present the chair of this panel, Common Elements for Criminal Accountability. Katia Salazar is the Executive Director of the Due Process of Law Foundation. She's a Peruvian lawyer, and before joining the organization, she was the adjunct coordinator of the Special Investigation Unit of the Truth Commission of Peru. Before that, she participated in Germany in a process, and she was a member of the Coalition Against Impunity, which presented the first case about the Argentinian dictatorship, the late, latest and worst dictatorship in Argentina. So, without further questions, Katia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and many thanks for being here, uh, here today. As Eduardo said, uh, my name is uh, Katia Salazar, and I am the executive director of the Due Process of Law Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and devoted uh, to promote the rule of law and human rights in Latin America. Joining me on the panel are Professor Christophe Safferlin, uh, Dixon Osborne, and Professor Chantal Meloni. Um, I will present them briefly. I thought Eduardo will going to do it, but uh, that's fine, I can do it. Uh, professor Christoph uh, Safferlin is professor of criminal law, criminal procedure, international criminal law, and public international law at the University Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen, and one of the vice presidents of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. Here on my left, uh, Dixon Osborne, American lawyer, former executive director at the Center for Justice and Accountability, nonprofit organization that seeks to deter torture, war, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other severe human rights abuses worldwide. He serves as adjunct, adjunct fellow at the American Security Project and on the working group for the Halifax International Security Forum. And on my right, uh, Professor Chantal Meloni, Associate Professor of Criminal Law at the University of Milan, where she teaches international criminal law and criminology. She also works with the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights here in Berlin, a senior legal advisor for the International Crimes and Accountability uh, Program. Um, on April 7, 2009, Former, president, uh, former Peruvian president Alberto Fujimori was sentenced to 25 years in prison by the criminal chamber of the Peruvian Supreme Court for kidnapping, murder, and serious injury committed during his first term as president uh, in the early 90s. Although he didn't shoot a single bullet, he was convicted for having command responsibility for the crimes committed. The Supreme Court of Peru, the Supreme Court's decision, also affirmed that Fujimori's crimes were part of a state policy of elimination of a part of the Peruvian population, and therefore they were also considered crimes against humanity, although they weren't included in the Peruvian criminal code at the time of the event. Fast forward last December, December 2018, a judge in El Salvador recognized that the El Mozote massacre constituted <coughs> war crimes and crimes against humanity, allowing the defendants to be tried for these charges, in addition to the other nine crimes they had already charged with under national law, among them aggravated rape and murder. The El Mozote massacre is one of the worst atrocities committed in modern Latin American history. Over the course of several days in, in December 1981, a battalion of the Salvadoran army murdered, tortured, and committed other acts of extreme violence against almost 1,000 civilians, most of them children, following a larger plan of extermination. The judge, the Salvadorian judge, 
rule that applying these charges did not violate the principle of legality because they were already crimes at the time of the massacre under international and customary law. The judge noted in his ruling that applying only the criminal law of 1973 would fail to account for the wide scale systematic nature of the atrocities that exceeded any reasonable or justifiable military operation. I chose these examples to show how international criminal law has had and continue to have an important impact in the fight against impunity in Latin America, but of course, similar examples could be found all over the world. In spite of the many different challenges of interpretation, implementation, and application of international criminal law, Following the underlying values of the Nuremberg principles mentioned in innumerable judicial decisions has been a pattern in landmark rulings from national courts all, all over the years. Having this context in mind, we will start with this first panel titled Common Elements for Criminal Accountability, where we will reflect on the developments that have occurred following the adoption of the IMT Charter and the formulation of the Nuremberg Principles, addressing how and to what extent the core values included in both documents still constitute a relevant source of guidance for different accountability mechanisms, including, sure, of course, criminal tribunals, hybrid courts, national courts, and quasi-judicial bodies, like truth commissions or commissions of inquiry. The panel will also discuss the common elements for criminal accountability, as well as the challenges that the international community faces in ensuring accountability for the commission of these crimes by non-state actors. We will start the panel with Professor Christoph Safferlin, who will reflect on the evolution of the definition of the core crimes since the charter of the International Military Tribunal. Christoph, what has been the principal contribution of the Nuremberg principles in the development of the core crimes under international criminal law? Well, thank you very much, Katya, for your introductory words and the question you posed uh, to me this morning. Um, the panel here is about the common elements of criminal accountability, and my role here is to, as Katya has said, say a few words on the criminal norms and the importance of the Nuremberg principles. And of course, uh, the main importance is that these crimes were developed here in Nuremberg. And you can imagine that in 1945, even before the war was over, and the first plans were evolving to actually have a criminal responsibility established for the Nazi major war criminals. The question was, which crimes can we actually prosecute for? And in the deliberations in summer of 45 in London, which then led to the London Agreement and the Charter of the IMT in August 1945, they came up with these three norms. First of all, crimes against peace. It's almost sort of a, let's say a, a religious phrasing, a crimes against peace. Yeah. And uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Whereas the concept of war crimes was established in a way, because there were Geneva Conventions, there were the Hague Regulations, the concept of crimes against peace was totally new, and also the concept of crimes against humanity as such wasn't existing before that. Of course, you had the term lingering around, in particular in diplomatic notes with regard to the Armenian what we now call genocide, um, as crimes against humanity. But it, there wasn't a clear legal concept. But crimes against humanity are actually a, quite a straightforward system in a way, because they encompass sort of attacks on individuals, which would be criminal acts in almost every domestic system. 
attacks on the life, attacks on uh, physical, uh, personal liberty, you know, torture, murder, manslaughter, and so forth. But the notion that comes with the crime against humanity is that it is done in a systematic manner. So it's not an individual case, it's in many individual cases. So the concept is maybe acceptable in a way, but you have a different problem that arises here. The problem of the sovereignty of the domestic state and the problem of how much can international law intervene into that. Because an individual murder, you would say, is not an issue for international law. So when does an individual killing become a problem of international law? When does international law, is international law justified to interfere in what is an internal affair? And that obviously was heavily disputed, not so much in London, but rather than here in this room. When the prosecution tried, Justice Jackson was mentioned here already in this room, tried to bring cases before the, the court that took place before the beginning of the war, before 1st of September 1939. In particular, the so-called Reichskristallnacht, the 1938 um, program against the Jewish population in Germany. So under which circumstances you can actually develop a legal concept that would allow international law to interfere in an internal matter without an armed conflict. If you have an armed conflict, this is a matter for international law. So international law is justified to develop a concept of war crime. But how about situations that are not actually connected to an armed conflict? And as many of you know, the tribunal here was very cautious and did not adopt the concept of crime against humanity to acts that took place prior to the beginning of the war. The other very complicated concept, of course, is the crimes against peace and the crime of aggression, as we call it now. And it uh, was, on the other hand, the one that was most prominently pressed for and most sort of severely prosecuted in this room, in particular according to the US American strategy, prosecuting strategy, because this was actually the one norm that Justice Jackson wanted to promote mostly to establish the criminalization of a war as sort of the source of all evil, so to speak. He wanted to set a precedent that wars are outlawed. Now, of course, later on, this concept turned to be the most problematic, as we all know, because in 1998, in the Rome Conference, the crime of aggression was recognized, but it wasn't defined, and it only became an international crime and part of the Rome Statute later on. And with regard to the crimes against humanity, even in the immediate aftermath of the Nuremberg main trial, in the subsequent trials, the connex to uh, an armed conflict, the context of a war, that this crime against humanity must have taken place, was dropped. So at the big, at, at in, in, to put it in a nutshell, we have these three crimes at the end of 1945-1946 uh, within the principle, the Nuremberg principles that would then be sort of in the world heritage presented as international principles and that would then dominate the discussion on the further developing of international criminal law. I leave it at that for the moment because I see you've Thank already... You. <laughs> well, I would have had a minute. She's so <laughs> should have looked at the picture. <laughs> and cool. I'm Thank following you. the rules. Thank you. But thank you, Katya. Dixon, I would like to ask you about the incorporation of international crimes in national accountability mechanisms. To start, can you describe the underlying values of criminal accountability under the Nuremberg principles that have been reproduced in national accountability mechanisms? Thank you, Katya. 
Thank you to the Nuremberg Principals Academy and to the very distinguished guests here. I think that I would be wisest just to adopt Navi Pillay's comments as my own and cede back the rest of my time. Uh, but instead, I shall venture forward and answer Katya's question. I think that there are four values uh, that derive from the Nuremberg Principles. First and foremost, of course, is, is rule of law. Uh, it, it established that there are core international crimes, uh, that individuals can be held responsible uh, for those core international crimes, and the way to do so is through due process of law before a neutral arbiter. Uh, so that is the core of the principles within the Nuremberg Principles, but I think that there's something even more fundamental in terms of the values, and, and that's truth. Uh, at the organization that I headed the last five years at the Center for Justice and Accountability, the thing that the victims and survivors wanted more than anything else was to be able to tell their story, uh, to be able to be heard, to find out what happened to them and to their family and to their communities. They wanted this recorded, and they wanted the history not to be erased. And the most effective mechanism of doing that is through a court of law, because you have a neutral arbiter who can adjudicate and determine that, yes, that what happened was, in fact, wrong. The third value I would suggest is prevention. You know, we're here because of the, the mantra, never again. Uh, and if we don't prevent the next round of genocide and crimes against humanity, we are not doing uh, you know, what we should. Now, if you look around the globe, of course, it feels like we failed on prevention, right? Uh, you know, you just look at uh, the incursion of Turkey into northern Syria this week, what's happening to the Uyghurs, what's happening to the Rohingya. Uh, but, uh, you know, in contrast to something that, that Leila Sadat said uh, earlier, she said that there's no evidence uh, that suggests that accountability leads to violence. There actually is some evidence that accountability uh, represses violence. And this is some of the work of Professor Catherine Sicking at Harvard, uh, whose look, especially at the Latin American context, to suggest that there is correlation between those countries that take accountability seriously and a reduction in violence. And there's some who disagree with her analysis and findings, but I think the point of the, the continued research and trying to find that linkage between accountability uh, and prevention is, is important. I would suggest the fourth value is democracy. Uh, part of what we want to achieve through the rule of law and through the courts is ultimately restoration of confidence in the democratic institutions that failed the victims and survivors at the outset. And if you're able to establish a judicial process, uh, if you're able to sta establish precedent, uh, if you're able to get the other institutions of governments stronger, then you rebuild the confidence that uh, so failed uh, the victims and survivors in the first place. Now, part of this may also be uh, you know, democracy leading to peace and justice, which Navi Play started us off with. And indeed, uh, the UN Office on Genocide Prevention said that links between justice and peace are, are very strong. Now, these four core values, I would suggest, rule of law, truth, prevention, and democracy, they've been described in other ways. They've been described as retributive justice or restorative justice. So there are different ways to describe the four values that derive from the Nuremberg Principles. I think there are some evolving values. Uh, and the question is whether or not these, this is an evolution of those values or if it's a statement of, of democracy. But I wanted to point our attention to a couple of examples before the ICC. The ICC prosecutor described that protecting the Rohingya from deportation from Myanmar into Bangladesh harmed the right of individuals to live in a particular state in which they were lawfully present. Quote, which means living within a particular culture society, language, set of values, and legal protection. In another case before the ICC, Ahmad al-Faqi al-Mahdi, uh, who uh, directed attacks against religious and historic uh, buildings, provides another example. And during opening statements, the ICC prosecutor uh, described the war crime as against that which constitutes the richness of whole communities. And it is thus a crime that impoverishes us all and damages universal values we are bound to protect. To protect cultural property is to protect our culture, our history, and our identity. So the question I would pose to the distinguished colleagues here is, is this an articulation of the principles of democracy or are we seeing a deepening understanding of the values that derive from the Nuremberg principles? 
I think there are also some challenges uh, inherent in uh, the values of the Nuremberg Principles because first and foremost, it's an articulation of individual criminal responsibility. And that leaves aside sort of the system criminality that occurs in genocide and crimes against humanity. No, these individuals who made decisions no, are not separate from the larger apparatus uh, in which these crimes took place. Uh, there is some acknowledgement of system criminality you know, through concepts like command responsibility, uh, recognizing that it is more than one individual person. But the question uh, that, that I would like to pose is, are there ways to address the system criminality uh, through the, the litigation and through other means? Uh, and I think that that is a, a value that uh, is challenged by the, by the Nuremberg Principles. So in, in summary, I suggest that there are four core values, rule of law, truth, prevention, democracy, uh, and uh, that there is some evolution of those values taking place, uh, both at the tribunal level as well as at the national mechanism level. Thank you, Dixon. Um, Chantal, let's talk about accountability of non-state actors under international criminal law. To what extent can non-state actors be held accountable under international criminal law? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katia, for uh, introducing this question. And I must say that uh, the first challenge for me in answering this question is to interpret uh, the very term non-state actors. Uh, it might seem something banal, but it's not. Uh, in fact, there is no authoritative uh, definition of uh, non-state actors under international law. And uh, this term has been used to indicate uh, a multitude of different subjects. I was reading this report uh, uh, by Redress uh, recently on torture committed by non-state actors uh, where it is affirmed that the broadest possible definition encompasses all private actors distinct from the state, including, uh, I quote, private individuals, uh, civil society organizations, uh, private companies, armed groups, uh, de facto regimes, uh, etc. So my observation is also that non-state actors can be also very much country-specific or situation-specific. What I mean is that what people will think about when this term is used is highly influenced by the context they find themselves. For instance, one will think of paramilitaries, groups, guerrillas, in Colombia, Mexico, other Latin American countries, uh, mafia organized crimes in Italy maybe, one thinks of rebel groups in African countries uh, or co corporate actors in other situations, but also drug dealers, human traffickers, armed smugglers, and of course, in particular in the last years, uh, terrorists. And indeed, this concept of non-state actors uh, is often used uh, to indicate just all those actors, uh, possible perpetrators of individual, of international crimes uh, that are non-state officials, uh, or to use a category of international law, better said, uh, whose actions are not attributable to the state. In this sense, it appears to me that it is a residual category. It is uh, defined a contrario. Who does not fall on the state side? can be labeled as a state, as a non-state actor. However, here we encounter a first problem because already the determination of who's the on the state side is not as simple as it might seem. And as it was noted, there is a certain porosity between state and non-state actors rather than being a clear, a stark dichotomy, there are many situations where already the determination of who's a state actor and who's not is an uneasy result of, that needs difficult interpretation. Let's think of the context of a non-international armed conflict where regular arms, regular arms members 
are of course state actors, while members of militias or armed groups would not be. And if this can appear quite easy, especially if we have a clear divide in the conflict opposing state to rebel groups, what about those mercenary armed groups that can be found fighting on the state side? These are not members of the regular armed forces of the state. Still, their actions are somehow connected to the state, or at least at the contextual and policy element, they fall within that policy. Another scholar, Frederick Maguire, suggests to define pro-state, non-state actors as hybrid state, non-state actors. A sort of uh, the military equivalent of what would be the government-supported NGOs, the gongs. Another example from a different scenario, corporations and corporate officers. These are clearly non-state actors as long as they are private companies and members thereof. However, some of the most egregious examples of involvement of corporations and corporate officers in the commission of international crimes is strictly related, if not interdependent, on the actions of state officials. Let's take the arms export as an example. In particular, I'm talking about crimes, possible crimes committed in that context. So here we see two layers of responsibility that are strictly connected. On the one hand, the state officials, normally officers at the ministerial level, those who authorized uh, the arms export, hypothetically in violation of the laws that regulate uh, arms exports. And on the other side, we find the responsibility of the corporate executives, uh, those who produce, uh, the manufacturers and uh, that export arms, that always in <coughs> hypothesis, uh, through such export, uh, provided the means to commit international crimes, uh, for instance, war crimes uh, or crimes against humanity, as the case may be. We have a case right now in Italy on exactly on this. <coughs> the list of examples can be long, but what I want to say is that it's not my intention here to delve into these distinctions because I really believe that this would bring us off-road or at least it will bring us too far from today's panel's focus, which should be, as it was already recalled, the common features on accountability rather than the particularities. And in doing so, it seems to me critical to keep a strong connection to international criminal law, as mentioned in the guiding questions. In other words, we are dealing exclusively with criminal responsibility here, and criminal responsibility for the commission of international crimes, as opposed to, for instance, obligations arising from international humanitarian law, human rights law, and, uh, um, and the possible accountability mechanisms uh, resulting uh, from these uh, international law regimes. And international criminal law, of course, can be enforced both directly, so through international tribunals, and indirectly, through domestic courts. And I suspect we will have a lot of uh, discussions on this in the next two days. But the bottom line here is that we are dealing with criminal responsibility of individuals as opposed to international responsibility of states, but also broader accountability mechanisms. And having said that, we shall not forget that this recognition that today seems uh, something achieved uh, and maybe we forgot the origins, but this recognition of the principle of individual criminal responsibility under international law is relatively recent. Uh, it is in this, one minute? In this court, exactly here, that uh, the revolution happened. Uh, so I guess this is the most quoted uh, 
passage of a judgment ever in the world, but still it's, it's worth mentioning it, uh, what the judges here at Nuremberg affirmed. Crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities, and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. But what did the Nuremberg judges have in mind when they affirmed this? They had in mind state actors. They had in mind persons that were acting on behalf of state, and this is why also the principle that was reminded to us by Professor Sadat, the non-relevance of official positions and uh, of uh, actions pursuant to state orders uh, was so revolutionary and so needed uh, here at Nuremberg. And I keep the remaining uh, round in the question. second round, mm -hmm. so here I stop. Thank you very much, Chantal. Uh, let's come back to Christoph. Uh, Christoph, what are the limitations of the definitions and scope of the core crimes under international criminal law today. What changes can be observed in the landscape of crimes since the, since the foundation by the International Military Tribunal Charter? Well, thank you again, Katia, now for this very interesting discussion that we are here having on this, on this panel. Um, it's, uh, you know, when we talk about the change since uh, the IMT since Nuremberg, I think the most obvious with regard to international norms is the creation of the um, genocide, uh, the crime of genocide, uh, which obviously took place in the immediate aftermath. Um, it was <coughs> the resolution of the First General Assembly that immediately followed the resolution of the Nuremberg Principles to establish the crime of genocide. Whereas the crime of genocide was not part of Nuremberg, the Nuremberg Charter it, itself, which, uh, you know, in the general public is not that known, actually, because you always think that the Nuremberg trial was about the Holocaust and about the genocide, where it wasn't. The norm was developed afterwards, uh, but as a clear reaction to the flaws, maybe, even, of, uh, the, of, the, of the judgment at Nuremberg in 1946 because it did not address, um, at least not uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a decent or satisfactory manner, um, the, the industrialized killing of millions of, of Jews and members of other minorities by uh, Nazi Germany. So the norm of genocide um, changed a lot. And whereas at Nuremberg, the crimes against peace and the crime of aggression was sort of the most prominent norm, it now turns out that the genocide has taken the stand when it is called as the crime of crimes by several of the tribunals and uh, the International Criminal Court. However, the crime of genocide is not easy for several reasons. I mean, it was crafted, obviously, with a view to the Holocaust, and it suits perfectly that situation for what it wasn't applicable because it came too late. Uh, when we look at other conflicts that came after that, it proves to be very difficult. The Rwanda case has shown that very dramatically to adopt this norm. So this is the one problem. The other problem, it seems to me, is that genocide is not only a legal concept, it's also a political concept. And it seems um, that if you cannot prove or can you, cannot claim that you are, as a group, victim of a genocide, you are actually not a victim of international crimes at all. It seems very important from a political stand to claim to be the victim um, of, of a genocide. I think this, this is a very difficult atmosphere at, uh, at the moment because the concept of crime against humanity developed here in Nuremberg is at least as strong as uh, the, 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 the crime of genocide. And I, I very much welcome um, the development of a convention because it would, uh, for crimes against humanity because it would you know, put that on a similar level with uh, the, the, the crime of genocide. So this is one, I think, very problematic, uh, very problematic issue with regard to the development of the norms 
uh, that we have the crime of genocide. And then, of course, <clears throat> we have, as I've already mentioned, the crimes against peace, or now, as it is called, the crime of aggression, um, which is now part of the Rome regime in Article 8 bis of the Rome Statute, but it hasn't been applied yet. It hasn't been put into force and it hasn't been prosecuted yet. It's a very difficult norm and the states have made sure that it is difficult to apply because the thresholds are very high. And even if maybe in 2007, uh, when, when the, the norm was crafted in Kampala, one would have thought that there wouldn't be historic moments where you could actually apply the crime of aggression. Even the events, very recent events in Syria and Turkey prove that it is highly necessary to have such a norm and such a norm that is actually functioning. So the development in this, in this regard has been very critical and very, very, um, very uh, difficult. Um, with regard to war crimes, as was also already said, we have, um, which is already mentioned by Dixon when he pointed at the destruction of uh, the cultural heritage, we have from the very, had from the very beginning a very solid sort of fundament through the Geneva Conventions, which I've mentioned, and uh, the Hague Law. And now there seems to be, uh, because there are cases evolving and the law develops by cases that where the, the law is applied. And even in German courts, there are now a lot of you know, war crime charges being brought forward and the law develops. No surprise there, right? But we need more cases in order to develop the law. And not only the cultural heritage um, situation that Dixon has, has mentioned, but also something like post-mortal personal dignity is now accepted as a sort of a legal good to be protected through war crimes. So even if you post a picture of yourself with a skull of a dead uh, enemy and, 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 you know, in a cheering atmosphere, this is an attack on a post-mortal right uh, of the person that has been killed. Not the killing, even if the killing, you know, not, notwithstanding the killing itself, but, but slowly the posing with that skull is a war crime. And of course this is the right approach because when it was the, the cultural heritage is protected, here it is the human dignity that goes beyond the death of a person, the respect also towards a corpse, towards a dead person that needs uh, the protection. And the most critical thing that we have in an armed conflict, of course, is that humanity needs protection here because the number one rule, which is usually applicable in any peaceful and civilization, that you must not kill, is indeed partially, at least, derogated. You are allowed to kill, you know, at least, um, at least um, uh, enemy combatants, you're allowed to kill. So if you derogate this principle norm, sort of humanity is under attack in principle. And this needs to be upheld, and I think it's a wonderful development um, that also was brought forward not only, but also by German courts that we respect the post-mortal rights to personal dignity through the war crime concept. Thank you, Christoph. Um, let's go to Dixon again and a very practical question, Dixon. Where do we stand regarding incorporation of core crimes globally through treaties, national jurisdictions that have adopted core crimes, etc.? And what does that say about future advocacy? Thank you, Katya. I look at our endeavor the past 70 years is developing what I'd call a global net of accountability. Uh, you could call it a, a legal framework, legal architecture, legal scaffolding, but what our endeavor has been has been to uh, you know, get treaties passed, get those laws domesticated into law, get institutions up and running that can adjudicate these laws for justice and accountability. And the Ideal, of course, is that we want to see every nation to be able to prosecute the crimes that take place in their own borders uh, through good, fair tribunals, courts. 
We also recognize that that's not always possible, uh, especially post-conflict. Uh, and so you need uh, tribunals, you need the ICC, and what our endeavor has been has been trying to plug in these impunity gaps over the last 70 years. Uh, the data suggests that we've actually made significant progress, but there is more progress to be had, and it points, Katya, to sort of the advocacy strategies that we may want to consider. Uh, the Genocide Convention currently has 152 state parties. The Convention Against Torture has 168 state parties. The Rome Statute has 122 signatories and 31 that have signed but not ratified. Uh, through the, the, both before and then through the process of complementarity, uh, a number of nations have incorporated one or more of these core international crimes into their national uh, legislation. Uh, the U.S. Library of Congress did a global survey in 2016, and it found then that there were 133 countries that have a domestic law concerning genocide com committed by their own nationals, that 111 countries have a domestic law concerning crimes against humanity committed by their own nationals, and 144 countries have a domestic law concerning war crimes com committed by their own nationals. Uh, digging deeper into this data points for me to some of the advocacy strategies that lie ahead uh, of where we might be able to pull resources. And I will do the caveat that this was data that was pulled back in 2016, so some of this information may have changed since then, and you may have country-specific knowledge uh, on these. Uh, but uh, there are two findings that I wanted to, to pull out of this data. Uh, the first one is that some states have codified at least one of the core international crimes, but not all three. Uh, for example, Bolivia, Brazil, Mongolia criminalized genocide, but not crimes against humanity or war crimes. Botswana, India, Malaysia, Sri Lanka criminalized war crimes, but not genocide or crimes against humanity. Indonesia criminalizes crimes against humanity, but not genocide and war crimes. And Jamaica and the United States criminalized genocide and war crimes, but not crimes against humanity. Uh, the second data point that I wanted to pull out of this is that uh, what I talked about in terms of uh, the states that have passed legislation, it was focused on their nationals. For many of these countries, they do not focus on the uh, uh, foreigners in their jurisdiction that have committed one of these crimes uh, abroad. So there is uh, a gap uh, uh, in, in the legislation. Uh, there are states that have criminalized all three core international crimes, but still provide a so-called safe haven uh, for foreigners within their jurisdictions suspected of committing one or more of those crimes. Those countries include Armenia, Bangladesh, the Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Mali, Nepal, Oman, Tajikistan, and Ukraine. And according to the Library of Congress, Ireland and the UK provide no safe haven for war crimes. No, they provide no safe haven for war crimes, but the gap exists on genocide and crimes against humanity. Uh, so this, to me, points out you know, some advocacy strategies of trying to plug these impunity gaps. Now, there's also a deeper layer of analysis here, and I'll, I'll just give one example on torture, which is even though these nations uh, have these laws on the books, they may not rise to the standard that we would want them to rise to, and so that there still needs to be some legislative changes to their work. Um, according to uh, the uh, report by Redress in September 2018, uh, it found that there are still states that do not have a specific criminal offense of torture in the national legislative frameworks, including Belarus, <coughs> Lebanon, Poland, Seychelles, and Thailand. Uh, in addition, Redress found that in other states, there's no definition of torture in line with Article I of the Convention, or there is an insufficient or incomplete definition of torture in their legislation. And that applies in the case of states including Rwanda, Congo, Ecuador, Hungary, Lebanon, Lithuania, Congo, Pakistan, and the UK. Uh, so it suggests to me that we've made enormous progress. If you see the number of states that have ratified some of the core treaties, the number of states that have domesticated the legislation into their own 
uh, national legislation. We've made enormous progress in 70 years, but there is obviously still much more work to be done, and the gaps identified in the research by the Library of Co Congress suggest uh, uh, ways in which we can move forward. Um, I'll conclude with just the encouraging sign uh, from these domestic laws uh, that, that have been passed, as you are seeing an increased uh, activity uh, for prosecution uh, of individuals, and, and you're seeing that especially in countries in the EU. Trial uh, produces an annual report on uh, universal jurisdiction, and in 2018, uh, it said that there were 16 nations and 60 cases exercised universal jurisdiction, bringing scrutiny, scrutiny to 140 suspected international crimes. So again, that suggests that there's been enormous progress in our ability to try to uh, say that there's some crimes so egregious that individuals should be held accountable wherever they are found. And this legal architecture, this global net, net of accountability uh, will continue to grow to reduce that impunity. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, let's come back to Chantal, and let's come back to the topic of the role of non-state actors. Chantal, what practices and precedents can be observed in relation to the advancement of criminal accountability of non-state actors? Yeah, where I left uh, sort of the discourse before was at Nuremberg, and uh, what we can see uh, is that uh, at Nuremberg and also uh, at the Tokyo trial, uh, um, the focus was largely on state actors, as I was saying, uh, even if, of course, we know that there were the very important subsequent proceedings, uh, which also involved the responsibility of uh, German industrialists and uh, other corporate officers. But it is a fact that, it, and this was observed uh, very well by Shebas, so I'd like to quote him. He said, the fact that there have been very few cases before international tribunals involving what he calls entrepreneurial villains who have exploited a situation of conflict in order to advance their own perverse personal agendas. Essentially, all prosecutions have involved offenders acting on behalf of a state or in accordance with a state policy or those acting on behalf of an organization that was state-like in its attempts to exercise control over the territory and size political powers. Whether this is true or not can be debated. In fact, with the establishment of new international criminal tribunals, in the first place the ad hoc tribunals, but then also the other special tribunals, hybrid tribunals, we have seen in the past 25 years a new development in the sense of an increased focus on non-state actors. And just to make a very short reference to the ICC, which is not the focus of uh, our conference, but only at the ICC, most, uh, I mean, more than half of the cases uh, focus on so-called uh, non-state actors. Uh, and uh, when you look at uh, the rate of uh, no, so-called non-state actors that are, in fact, uh, in prison, uh, this is basically the total uh, of those who have been uh, brought before the ICC. So whether this is a real trend or just a result of uh, a opportunistic prosecutorial policy can be debated. And when I talk about opportunistic prosecutorial policy, I mean both at the international and at the non-international level, at the domestic level. Before the ICC, what could make, let's say, easier for the prosecutor to focus on non-state actors or so-called non-state actors are several elements, among which I would like just to mention two. The self-referrals, let's think about the Uganda and DRC situations, and more generally, more broadly, the issue of the cooperation, the needed cooperation by states. And before domestic courts, uh, of course, uh, a huge impact uh, has uh, the issue of immunity because the rules of immunity, and here I really don't need to elaborate on this, but 
apply differently before international and non-international tribunals. And we see this, for instance, now before German courts uh, that apply the Völkerstrafgesetzbuch, uh, uh, so the Code of uh, Crimes Against International Law with regard in particular to the crimes committed in Syria. And of course, it's easier to prosecute uh, those who are not uh, sitting uh, as uh, state uh, agents. But whatever the case may be, given the development of the last years, uh, so that sees more and more non-state actors involved, uh, uh, indicted for the commission on international crimes, uh, the issue of course has been uh, debated among uh, international criminal law scholars. Uh, and uh, perplexities, uh, doubts uh, have been raised uh, uh, as to the desire desirability of this trend. Some scholars have argued that this is not actually a desirable trend because international crimes are crimes that involve states and this is what makes them specially blameworth and serious and international crimes could, should not become crimes committed potentially by lone wolves. And here the reference is, of course, to terrorism. Definition of crimes could be watered down, according to some scholars, when applied to non-state actors, in particular when we think of genocide and crimes against humanity. For war crimes, the situation is different because non-international uh, humanitarian law has long recognized the applicability of uh, rules also to non-state actors. Anyway, this, I just want to mention this to say that this is part of a much broader debate uh, that actually touches upon the, real, the foundations of international criminal law. And the debate is about uh, what are properly international crimes. Uh, and so what should be under the prosecutorial attention at the international level? In any event, and here I come back again to Nuremberg, it is undisputed that individuals shall be punished for the commission of crimes under international law and this in order to achieve the typical goals of criminal law which is retribution, prevention, deterrence. And this we find it very well now said in the preamble of the Rome Statute of 98. So, at least we can say there is consensus on this, uh, on, the on the basic principle, but the challenge starts as soon as the principle needs to be implemented. Who can be responsible for what? Who bears the higher share of responsibility along the chain of command? What rules apply to the attribution of criminal liability under international criminal law? With the exception of Nuremberg, the various international criminal tribunals that have been established so far only prosecuted, uh, only had jurisdiction over natural persons. However, this is already a huge debate, which is an open debate, whether it's possible to hold legal persons and among these corporations criminally liable under international law. Suggestions have been put forward in this direction by scholars. And if we have a look at the domestic systems, we see that, for instance, in Europe, there are several countries that allow the criminal responsibility of corporation, just to make an example among others, France, where at the moment there is a very important case, the Lafarge one, that involves the Lafarge Corporation, a cement manufactory, for commission, possible commission of crimes against humanity in Syria beside financing terrorism. But leaving aside these domestic exceptions, the only possibility so far to hold the corporate corporations accountable before international criminal tribunals for their involvement in the commission of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, is to target the corporate agents, meaning those acting on behalf of the corporation, and this is normally done on the base of complicity charges. 
But here, the challenge is posed by uh, this need uh, to use complicity, which has uh, quite a high threshold, especially with regard to the mens rea element, uh, are difficult to overcome. And here, just, yes, the last note, because I only have one minute left, to maybe keep it for the hope, hopefully rich discussion that we're going to have after this, um, a note on the fact that from its very inception, from the very beginning, international criminal law has to deal, has had to deal with this existential conundrum, with this existential uh, um, yeah, divide. On the one side, the systemic and collective dimension of the crimes at stake, and on the other side, the need to narrow down, individualize the responsibilities and define them. And of course, we observe in the practice of the international criminal tribunals and domestic courts that were active so far, different mechanisms that have been used in this direction. Again, only to mention Nuremberg conspiracy. ICTY, ICTR, and other international tribunals, joint criminal enterprise, but also command responsibility. And now before the ICC, we see this difficult concept of the control over the crime, so co-perpetration, indirect perpetration. So what is the bottom line? Can we identify common elements applicable before the various judicial institutions that apply international criminal law? For me, this is really a difficult task, but what I would say is that notwithstanding the difficulties, international criminal law has consistently rejected collective liability. And it leans toward a better uh, establishment of the principle of personal culpability uh, with regard to the commission of individual, of international crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chantal. Thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Chris, uh, Dixon, sorry, mm. for your very rich and provocative comments and reflections. We have now time for uh, some questions and comments for the audience. I think we have like, I would say, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, so let's open the floor for, for questions and comments. Maybe we can put together two or three questions and then give the word to, the, to our panelists. A ver, there is one here, um, we start here. Thank you very much to the entire panel for this uh, interesting uh, debate. I would like to pick up on one point that was made, the distinction between state and uh, non-state actors. And Chantal, it sounded a bit as if, in your view, the non-state actors is a kind of a second-class perpetrator. And that would tie in with quite a number of criticism that the ICC has faced, and maybe other institutions will face as well, as uh, not going for the big fish, but going for the local warlords. Uh, is that a, a dilemma that all institutions share regardless whether they are Rome statute based, uh, ad hoc tribunals, hybrids, is that something uh, that of course those non-state actors which are not protected do not have a powerful backing and certainly do not fall under the discussion that Lida Sadat pointed to this morning. Are they the easy fish and is that why they are the, uh, the, the target of uh, first choice? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who else? Uh, is there only there? Thank you. Is it on? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating panel. Um, I was struck by one of the comments uh, that Christoph made um, at the very beginning of um, his presentation concerning the crime of aggression. And I tried to link it to the very wonderful um, a keynote address from this morning um, concerning the um, legitimate complaints that African states might have. And I wondered whether you would um, agree with the contention, the proposition that perhaps the difficulties with the crime of aggression is precisely that it's a crime that's likely to be committed by the powerful. 
um, Lesotho is not going to commit a crime of aggression or Lesotho officials are not going to commit the crime of aggressions. The states and their officials that are likely to be guilty of such crimes are the powerful. And if that's true, and I think it is, um, is it then a fair contention to say that the international criminal justice system as it is developing is in fact geared towards the protection of the powerful? Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comment before giving the word to the panelists? Okay, so um, uh, Christophe Chantal. <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> yeah, you put already the finger <laughs> right in the wound. Um, I mean, I just suggested uh, a possible uh, interpretation uh, of effect, which is, yes, that in front of the ICC we have a majority of uh, accused uh, uh, that are, that are non-state actors or so-called non-state actors. And um, yes, I do believe that it has to do with the fact that Practically speaking, it was easier to arrest some of these people rather than uh, uh, state uh, officials. And if you ask me personally, um, I, I don't think that um, a case uh, um, like the one against Lubanga was uh, um, not important. I think it was very important, of course. Um, but at the same time, uh, it, it's a bit comparable to what maybe it was the beginning of the ICTY when uh, they started with uh, Erdemovic. Uh, and uh, this was not... Uh, enough, S as simple as that. Uh, it can be a prosecutorial uh, strategy, of course, to start lower in the chain of command in order then to build a, a broader picture, but it's important uh, then to go up. And I think this is sometimes the reason why the ICC is also under quite some criticism at the moment. Mm -hmm. Christophe. Thank you very much for the questions that uh, were brought forward to me. Um, maybe I can, I hope I'm not limited to the five minutes now. Um, I start with maybe a little bit of a, a broader picture. You know, being in this room, the world or the ICL world in Nuremberg was fairly easy. Uh, the war was over. Uh, Germany was destructed, the army was defeated. Um, all the relevant persons, unfortunately not those who committed suicide like Adolf Hitler and others, but those that were still here, still alive, were uh, imprisoned by the Allied forces. And of course all the evidence was there because Germans were very good in you know, bureaucratic taking note of all the crimes that they committed. So that was an easy, a fairly easy task, okay? I say that because when we now measure our expectancies towards the ICTY, the ICTR, and now to the ICC and other tribunals, we have this in mind. We think that we can prosecute the Gurings, the Keitels, and the Yodels that, that sat here um, very easily. Um, but we don't even get hold of them because they can evade, they can evade justice, they can find safe havens, uh, havens here, and, here and there. But our expectancy is what we have in mind about the pictures from this room and the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal. So we have to sort of water down a little our expectancies. And then I think also we have to differentiate between what goes on in the national courts and what goes on and what should go on in an international forum. Because like in Germany, we prosecute so many Germans and, and Syrian nationals that are here, so why do we do this? 
Um, we do this first and foremost because they are here and we need to do this for the German society, for the peace within our own domestic system. And then, of course, we do this also because we want to send a signal to the world that what has happened there is an international wrong. And we want to take, show a signal that there is no safe haven here in Germany for those who committed those crimes. Um, but so we, we, must, we must also prosecute those small fish, small fry, the non-state actors here in Germany because we cannot tolerate to have murderers living amongst us. Of course, the ICC, with this other sort of international forum, is suggested to have more important, maybe, persons. But uh, that's obviously um, difficult for the reasons that Leila gave us. And thank you again for your clear words and your clear opinion uh, on that, um, and for other more practical, more practical reasons. So, the vision of Nuremberg is still alive and it was easier then than it is now, so we have to maybe uh, you know, put our expectancies into, into the relation to the, to, to the world and the practical approaches to criminal prosecution, criminal prosecution now. And now as to the crime of the aggression, um, of course it is most difficult to prosecute. And again, in Nuremberg it was easy because they were all, here, they were all there. Um, it's most difficult because it is of a little bit of a different nature compared to the crimes against humanity and the war crimes because indeed it has within sort of its structure uh, the censoring of the state that the state has committed an act of aggression. So it's much more embedded in public international law, in UN law, in the charter law um, compared to an ordinary war crime. So this makes it much more difficult. Um, the German law previously did not have a sort of um, a, a, a um, um, restriction of the perpetratorship of a crime of aggression as the statute has now. It has this, you know, it's only, only the, the, the most serious person, uh, political leaders and so forth can become perpetrators of that. I don't think that this would have been necessary um, to reduce the applicability and the, the, the scope of the crime of aggression to that uh, group of persons. But in Kampala, this way was, was chosen. And of course, also this makes it more, much more difficult to, to prosecute the crime, uh, the, the crime of aggression. Thank you, Christoph. Doesn't seem to be happy there. <laughs> Maybe Dixon can clarify things. Questions, <laughs> comments? Uh, Atalia, one. Well, first of all, to, to thank uh, the panelists for the uh, thought-provoking presentations. I, I must say, sitting in, in, in this room, I, uh, I always do get an inspiration and a sense of optimism uh, when I listen to uh, uh, colleagues such as yourselves take us back uh, and remind us of, uh, you know, the importance of acting uh, uh, collectively and, and uh, the importance of the whole multilateral system. And to also thank, of course, the, the tone setting, a very good uh, um, keynote speaker uh, this morning. Christoph, you, you mentioned something in the beginning that really kept me thinking about how this whole dichotomy between the national and the international sometimes, of course, is a false dichotomy. And, and it, as, a, as a gender activist and a feminist, it reminds me of the attempt to resist uh, the claim for women's equality uh, from people who will say women's rights or the rights of married women and so on are private matters if women are beaten up by their husbands <coughs> or partners. It's a matter for the inside. And just to say that for me, I think these are old arguments and we should not allow them also to, to, take, to, take, um, to remain alive <laughs> at, at, at the international. So I'm glad you, you raised that to, to say that it is a fundamental question that people ask. But I think in the same way that, yeah, the personal is political, 
for me as a feminist, I think the national uh, and the international should not be falsely separated. And I know that the intricacies and technicalities of, of the law sometimes make it difficult. I think related to that is what you said, Dixon, uh, about, and I'm, uh, I thank you for mentioning my country as one, Botswana, as one of the countries that has passed domestic legislation mm -hmm. um, uh, to, you know, to, to domesticate the Rome Statute. Yes, our statute does have gaps, and I think that study would be very, very important for us and interesting. I would like to, to, to see the, the, that research because I think we can all learn from each other. We remain a strong supporter of the ICC with all its, its, its faults. We believe that it is our responsibility to, to, to support uh, the ICC. So I, I think that that really was a, a very uh, uh, important study you mentioned. I must say I'm not aware of it, so I'm indebted to you. Finally, non-state actors. You are aware, of course, Chantal, that in, in, in Geneva there is a working group on the transnational companies uh, where I'm based uh, as ambassador to, uh, to, to the UN. Uh, it's a difficult subject, but I think it's a subject we must tackle and find ways of making sure that the resistance of international law to that collective responsibility, uh, we, we, we are active in the group that is negotiating uh, an attempt to have a treaty, uh, at least uh, to protect the human rights of those who are violated by transnational companies. So thank you very much. Thank you, Atalia. Um, any other comment, question? Uh, you, again? Okay, that's fine. <coughs> I also have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I really do apologize. I, I'll just push back just a little bit, and this will be my last pushback um, for the conference. Um, um, so <laughs> the response that well, what makes it difficult is that it also implies, in a sense, the wrongdoing of the state um, really ought not to matter. I mean, um, if we are concerned about the devastation, as a normative policy point, if we're concerned about the devastation that war and aggression wreaks, um, then our only concern ought to be to hold those accountable. So the fact that it's, it's a crime that is attributable to a state, crimes against humanity can be attributable to a state. In fact, the definition suggests that in all likelihood there's some state involvement and yet nobody says, but let's not, you know, let's not pr prosecute those crimes for the possibility that um, it may um, also somehow um, r relate to the responsibility of the state. Um, just one last comment, if I may, and that's actually relating to the first question um, concerning um, the um, proportionality of accused at the ICC. I, I wonder if that is not because um, if you look at those accused, they generally come from those situations that are quote unquote self-referred, right? Um, there's a wonderful study that was done by um, a Dutch uh, um, scholar, um, Sarah Noven, um, who suggests that there was some kind of a deal struck. We will refer, when we refer, don't prosecute us, prosecute the other. Um, so I wondered if you wanted to maybe chime in on that one as well. Mm -hmm. mm, I have a question too, if you allow me. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about these attempts that have been happening during the last years to broaden the definition of crimes against humanity, to include, uh, for example, crimes against environment or, or even grand corruption? Um, I haven't followed the discussions, but I have followed uh, recently a discussion in relation to grand corruption and Venezuela because, um, as you know, well, there is a preliminary investigation open on Venezuela before the ICC. And uh, actually, Transparency International, here, uh, the former board president of Transparency, uh, went to the ICC and discussed with, uh, uh, with members of the ICC the possibility to broaden the content of the crimes against humanity. Of course, it didn't work out, but at least they were trying to like, include grand corruption as a criteria for gravity, for example. Anyway, they there are different attempts to, to, to take into account these other considerations in the evaluations of crimes against humanity. So I would like to know your opinion about that. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting and difficult questions to answer. Natalia, maybe I can come back to what you, uh, what you said. And I just wanted to stress again that the difficulty, I think, is, um, you know, what, what, is, what is within the realm of international law and what is sort of uh, in, in the realm of the domestic constitutional level? And this has obviously developed over the last uh, decades. And, and you, the United Nations Security Council, you know, developed also the approach of more and more um, interfering into what were previously conceived as internal affairs, purely for humanitarian reasons. And this was definitely the right approach. And it's my intimate conviction that human rights are not derogable at an internal uh, domestic level. And in particular, also what you stated, um, sexual violence, gender violence, you know, the, the human dignity is of concern to the international community and is, is not to be derogated by the internal laws. And this is exactly what the Nuremberg Principle number two, actually, in my conviction, um, intends to say, that um, this is indeed, um, but, I mean, we, but we have to define what is of concern to the international community. Um, but if we define it, um, and human rights are of concern to the international community, then internally you cannot derogate it. And if there are massive violations, then it is an international crime. So this is my, uh, my, uh, my maybe cl clarification to what, you, uh, to what you said. But this developed over the last uh, decades in a quite a uh, dramatic way. Now, um, the, the crime of aggression, I did, I, so I did, you, you understood me wrongly if I said I'm happy with the concept as it is. But I think that the criticism or the, the, the reluctance of the states to actually go forward uh, with the crime of aggression um, it is even bigger uh, than compared to crimes against humanity is because it, it sort of, um, it, it is connected to this, uh, to this um, plea that the state as such committed an act of aggression and a violation, a blatant violation, manifest violation of the UN Charter. And no state is sort of, so to say, willing to accept this as, uh, as a concept that easily compared to a war crime or crimes against humanity where it's more sort of adequate. I have the impression. And, and for a crime against humanity and a war crime, on the other side, you most of the time have clear victim groups. But what actually, who actually is the victim of a crime of aggression? The other state. So you, you, you know what I mean? You have two entities and this is not so much individualized as these other concepts, crime against humanity and war crimes. This is why I said there is a, there's a difference in the character of the crime, and the states even like this, like this crime even less than the other, uh, than the other international, international crimes. Uh, this would be my, my maybe uh, enhanced explanation on that. Crimes against humanity and expanding the concept, well, I have to say that I'm not really a friend of that. Um, don't, put, don't try to put everything that is of international concern within the concept of the crime against humanity. I mean, it's difficult, as we see um, nowadays, to even sort of uphold the level that we have. So if you now come up with corruption and environmental issues and so forth, uh, on a general level, you water down the concept, I would say. Keep it, um, keep it strict, sort of, uh, with a concern of acts that really violate the human dignity as such, that are, so that, are, that are an outcry on human dignity. This, this is what I, what I understand by crimes against uh, humanity as a concept, uh, and I would try to keep it focused on, 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 on that. Thank, Thank you. you, Christophe. Chantal? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, the first question was about uh, um, what I think of these uh, uh, possible impact of self-referrals uh, to the ICC practice, and I think I already, yeah, I kind of already indicated in my presentation that uh, indeed, uh, um, this this connection has been made. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether it is just um, 
a practical reason or if there is more, like what you sort of uh, uh, suggested because I cannot know whether there was a deal. But what I know is that in 2006, uh, I was working as a, a legal assistant in pretrial chamber that was uh, in charge of the Uganda situation. And it was at the very beginning of that situation. And uh, the prosecutor had already made the decision, the five warrants of arrest against the LRA were, uh, had been issued by the pretrial chamber. And I remember, now a long time ago, so I think I can say this, uh, I'm not revealing any secret, but uh, I remember in particular the judge uh, I was working with uh, asking me really to find, to research any possible, any possible mechanism within the ICC statute that could uh, push the prosecutor also to focus on the other side, uh, which was of course the Ugandan army. And we tried our best inside the pretrial chamber to find something, but there is nothing that allows the judges uh, to push the prosecutor to investigate in a direction where he or she doesn't want to. But from here, I'm not inferring any, anything. Um, about uh, the, um, what was mentioned about the work uh, in Geneva, uh, for the victims of crimes committed by transnational companies. I am totally sympathetic with that and I really, I don't want to give the impression that I am uh, closing uh, to that perspective, but what I wanted to, um, to say, maybe didn't come out so clearly, is that if we are talking about criminal liability, strictly criminal liability, um, international criminal law and the criminal liability under international criminal law has exactly the same nature as criminal liability in domestic uh, law. So the possibility, of course, to deal with uh, systematic collective violence uh, is something that it's, ne it's needed, it's necessary, but at the same time, uh, I think that the principle of individual criminal responsibility and the personal of personal culpability is a huge advancement of our democratic liberal systems, modern systems, and we should not go back to forms of collectivization of criminal liability. Then it's different if you have next to it forms, other forms of accountability that can be also partially criminal, administrative slash criminal. There are some examples in these directions, but, um, but um, yeah, conceptually, I, sh I would still keep this uh, divide. Thank you, Chantal. Dixon, we have two minutes. Whenever I look at a, a, a case, I'm trying to figure out how to get from A to Z. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, and I think when you look at corruption, uh, you can both look at uh, individual accountability, but also building out rule of law as a possibility. And for individual accountability as a, as a prosecutor, you're looking to see what the evidence is that you have. You may not have the evidence to prosecute one of the core international crimes, but you may have the evidence to, to pursue uh, corruption charges. And so that may be a perfectly legitimate strategy. Uh, I think going back to the values I started off at the beginning, one of our goals also is, is prevention under the Nuremberg principles. And there is a strong linkage between corruption and country and the possibility of commission of core international crimes. So if you can put in place mechanisms that target that corruption uh, early on, you may also be able to do a prevention strategy on the core international crimes. Thank you, Dixon. I think we are finishing on time, our panel. Thank you very much again, Christoph, Chantal, and Dixon. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.